discussion in science communication and engagement is complete uh, without reflecting upon how organizations and individuals um, in science engagement responded and evolved during the pandemic, COVID-19 pandemic. So while the pandemic is offsetting the years of progress on economic and literacy fronts for many, many communities, um, how well has it done for science or health education and communication? Um, I'm going to address the pandemic in the present tense because of the recent developments of new variants and spurts of new cases being reported across the globe. So while the virus and vaccines take the center stage, has it curtailed the communication of other important aspects like climate change and antimicrobial resistance? Um, all of these are questions that are spewing in all our minds, and we shall address all of these questions through this panel discussion. Uh, with this, I would uh, like to invite our panelists on stage for the discussion. Uh, we have Sean Elias, an immunologist and science communicator based at the Jenner Institute, University of Oxford. Um, since joining the Institute in 2008, uh, Sean has worked as uh, worked on a number of studies and clinical trials, testing vaccines uh, developed against a host of different uh, infectious diseases, including malaria, Ebola, and salmonella. Uh, during the pandemic, uh, he has worked as a part of the uh, Oxford COVID-19 vaccine communications team, uh, providing scientifically accurate information uh, directly from the team to both the public and uh, worldwide media. Welcome, Sean. Um, Next, we have uh, Dr. Tasha Koch, the co-founder and co-director of Erwaza, South Africa. Uh, Erwaza was uh, established in 2013, an informal collaboration between many individual and organizational stakeholders in Cape Town, South Africa. Uh, before working full-time on Erwaza, uh, Tasha was a junior research fellow at the uh, Molecular Mycobacteriology Research Unit um, UCT, uh, which she maintains in a part-time position. Welcome, Tasha. And our third and final speaker is Madhushri Kama, uh, the program manager at Science Gallery Bengaluru. Uh, while Madhushri completed her master's degree in biological sciences uh, from the Tata Institute of Fundamental Research, her passions are illustration and user experience design. She recently completed her master's in design from the National Institute of Design, uh, focusing on accessible graphic representations of complex scientific concepts. Uh, she has been part of uh, organizing several public engagement programs over the years, uh, including Frontiers of Science and Chai and Y. Uh, welcome everyone, and thank you for joining today. Um, to, okay, yes, everyone's on the panel. Um, okay, the format today will be sort of a free-flowing uh, discussion with uh, structured thoughts to do justice to the title that we have for today's session. So during the course of the discussion, I would um, uh, request and encourage all the panelists to feel free to pitch in wherever necessary. Right, let's get started then. Um, let I would like to... Uh, first request, Sean, to talk a little bit about their efforts of outreach uh, during the pandemic. Um, at the core of communication and public engagement of COVID-19 and the Oxford AstraZeneca vaccine, um, could you uh, talk to us a little bit, little bit about the outreach and how the outreach and communications changed um, as your work came to uh, be in the global spotlight during the pandemic? Thank you for having me, um, and it's a pleasure to be here. Um, and yes, yeah, so um, as Kushishita has already given the introduction, I was very much a lab scientist for the last kind of uh, 10 uh, plus years, um, but I always had an interest in public engagement. So from my point of view, and actually this represents a lot of the kind of scientists here at the Jenner Institute, University of Oxford, most of our science engagement and our communications um, as scientists was very much the kind of traditional sense. It was science festivals, it was going to events, it was hosting um, kind of access events at the labs and things like that. And personally, I did a lot of work in my free time. It was um, on the odd day when science festivals are, but also, for example, doing things on weekends just because I enjoyed that science communication. Um, a personal project of mine was using board games as a, as a tool for communicating uh, science with younger audiences. Um, and obviously, when it came uh, to the start of the pandemic, obviously, we were very much doing our kind of normal jobs, um, working in the lab. But we kind of had this immediate 
uh, notion that we needed people to kind of be doing the science communication directly with the kind of particularly the media to start off. Um, and we didn't really have anyone set up to do that when we didn't have really have that experience. So um, uh, Professor Sarah Gilbert um, at the start of the pandemic asked, given that I had probably the most experience in public engagement and communications um, among the scientists in our group, asked whether I'd be help, able to help document um, the kind of work we're doing and also early, early on communicate directly with journalists and, and kind of the media. Now, normally this kind of setup, anyone who's worked in or is aware of the university setup, the university um, has a kind of central public engagement, well, central public engagement, but also has central communications. So the public affairs directorate are the ones who kind of deal with the kind of the bigger university scale stuff. But it actually took quite a while for them to kind of get involved. So very much in the early stages of the pandemic, when we had obviously had the initial lockdown here in March in the UK, we had no kind of formal setup. And so it was very much up to me as a scientist with no kind of formal media training and just very much a, a passion for kind of communications um, to not only speak to journalists, to explain what the kind of background is of how our vaccine was made um, and what's going on with kind of vaccine development, um, but also to document things like take um, video for use in the news, take photos. Actually, a lot of my initial the initial uh, pictures from kind of the vaccine manufacturer um, were actually very much mine. So the kind of pictures of the early the first vaccines and things like that were the stuff that I took. I'm not a professional photographer. I just have an interest in doing it. Um, and kind of this, as we kind of moved on, it obviously became a bit more of a professional setup. We got more uh, kind of stuff from the university, more professional comms people to help guide that. And I think that was very important because obviously liaising with journalists is, is very much a different skill. Um, and once you kind of needed to have a, a kind of, kind of agreed upon messaging um, and a consistent message were for the importance of obviously national understanding of what's going on that stage was very important so my role moved more towards the kind of behind the scenes um, kind of still helping explain writing FAQs um, but we found very much from the point of view of both the communication side and the scientist side having this integration where you've got a scientist in the middle to kind of bridge that gap um, was very very useful because not only the comms people who maybe didn't have a full understanding of the science had someone they could ask on a regular basis. But equally, if there was a particular science point that what I was asked to kind of write a kind of uh, pieces about and, and kind of convey that message, it was important to have that kind of integration. Okay, awesome. Um, I'm really glad, you know, you could have the ability to, you know, sort of evolve very quickly and also, you know, um, work through uh, especially when everything just shut down and you had to practically work, you know, um, on an individual basis from homes or, you know, the small communities that you were in, right? So, um, so outreach and awareness, like, you know, like I said, we're limited to digital methods, um, it, you know, as the pandemic set in. So um, how do you think this change uh, affected different target audiences and, you know, how has it been uh, for the better or worse? Yeah, very much so. I think the whole kind of move to digital communications as a primary method of communicating science is a double-edged sword. So if I take my personal experience, I'm used to, before the pandemic, speaking to small groups, maybe 10 to up to 100 individuals at most, mostly children and a few parents and things like that. So obviously, when we're moving across to the communication through the media, the university obviously has experience of that, but it's still on quite a small scale. You might have an interview in say our institute once every year, if anything, before the pandemic, yet we're getting national requests all the time. Um, and so building up a relationship with the kind of media is something that did improve during that pandemic. So at the start, they were getting quite a few things wrong about the science, but once they realized that they had scientists and, and, and obviously uh, experts on, on call who they could get the correct answers from, they learned that it's a value to both sides to make sure that information is correct. In terms of the double-edged sword, um, this comes from because digital media is great for communicating to a mass, the masses, um, but it's also a great way of communicating misinformation as well as information. And also the kind of approach that involves using the like national media is great. You reach a lot of people, but you reach a very specific audience. And actually the kind of audiences that maybe we need to reach are not those traditional audiences. Um, and particularly the kind of young people who get a lot of the information from social media rather than traditional media. Um, and so a lot of the battle um, that has kind of evolved and is still ongoing has been how do we utilize these alternative methods to kind of maximize getting the right message across. Um, we can use the traditional media to help with that, 
But actually, I don't think you'll necessarily convince those people who are, who are always already getting their information from the kind of social media rather than media. So as scientists, I think there's been an increase in, in trust in the messages that come from scientists. And I think that's been one of the real positives about having access to the scientists doing the groundwork and also a mix of having not only the big names and the senior people, from our point of view, it's people like Sarah Gilbert and, and uh, Professor Ed Pollard, um, who have obviously spent a lot of time uh, engaging with the media, both on very serious matters, but also some quite lighthearted matters, um, which obviously humanizes that, the kind of us as scientists. And I think also as the pandemic's moved on and we've had a bit more freedom, kind of introducing the kind of the rest of the team and showing that, okay, science is not just about the professors. There's, there's hundreds and hundreds of people behind the scenes who do just as much work, um, who've sacrificed a lot during the pandemic. And that side of it has been very important for uh, improving trust of scientists. And sometimes some individuals want to listen to those individuals who are not necessarily the people at the top, the people on the ground um, are arguably more relatable. And I think the final point in, in this kind of side of engagement is sometimes about picking the right people to do the engagement. We're lucky enough that here in our institute um, and in the university, we've got a very, very diverse range of scientists. So it's very much picking the kind of sometimes the right face for the audience. We've done quite a lot of engagement recently uh, kind of, uh, with various populations in Africa. So, for example, I gave uh, I was part of a panel discussion with the um, uh, Anglican bishops of the Democratic Republic of Congo. And when dealing with uh, African populations, for example, it's very important to have a, a representative face. So we've obviously having members of the team who are of African heritage. Um, they have gone down very well on the panel because they appear as a lot more relatable than necessarily a, a typical white male scientist, um, which is the kind of stereotype to an extent. Um, so this is something we've learned, but equally there's obviously a lot of challenges associated with uh, dealing with misinformation. Um, and But also for our point of view, it's about understanding the needs and what people kind of uh, feel and understand about the science. Um, it's not always just about getting out the straight information. Uh, you have to be relatable. Absolutely. I think um, understanding the background and culture of the people whom you're communicating with is very, very important. With that, um, I want you to hold your thoughts there and then I'll move a little, um, move, shift the focus a little uh, where we discuss. I want to, um, I want to discuss with Tasha uh, about um, how her initiatives and her approach sort of changed uh, because at Ewosa you mostly uh, communicate and engage with the audience about about issues on HIV and TB, but uh, during the pandemic, uh, did um, the communications for these two conditions take a backseat? Um, and how will it affect your efforts in the long term? Thanks, Suchi. Um, I just wanted to say thanks for inviting me and for having me. And then I also just wanted to apologize um, to the organizers and to everyone on the call. I got the times wrong and I'm gonna have to drop off at half past two. Um, it's actually a South African holiday here. It's quite a big holiday. So I've got family stuff that I need to run off and do. And I didn't, I actually just saw now that the session ends a bit later. So I'm, I'm really, really sorry about that. Um, and so in response to the question, um, it, it was really difficult. Um, and so I think um, similar to Sean, there were positives and negatives and challenges and benefits. And so one of the negative points about the pandemic and its impact on engagement was a, it was quite deflating because it was another pandemic where there was misinformation and where sort of communication and engagement efforts weren't prioritised, at least in South Africa. Um, there was a huge corruption scandal around money that was meant to go for communications um, to South, the South African population that had basically been stolen by corrupt individuals so um, or politicians. And so that was really difficult in a sense because it felt like with TB and HIV, we had been here before, you know, and, and, and we should have known better with this new pandemic, especially because um, TB and HIV are such a big problem in South Africa. Um, and sort of on the scientific side, that there was also a big benefit about the infrastructure around TB and HIV in South Africa, allowing us to make scientific discoveries. And that was not highlighted early on in the pandemic. It is now, but in the very early stages, it wasn't. Um, I think a huge positive about the pandemic, um, even for HIV and TB engagement, is it put science in the spotlight. And so, you know, previously HIV and TB were these diseases that had been around for a long time, so almost boring. You know, people would often ask me what I did, and I'd say I'm a TB researcher, and they'd go, TB? 
And I'd go, no, TB, tuberculosis. And when the pandemic happened, all of a sudden scientists were sort of really important and were rock stars. And so this idea of science engagement became really important. Um, and I think, I think that is a benefit we'll feel um, for a long time to come because I think policymakers and, and people in power and funders have seen how important engagement is in order to combat infectious disease and other health issues. Um, and I think another positive for the pandemic is it allowed us to develop a lot of capacity that once the emergency response to, to COVID is over, we can then go back and we've already sort of started doing that and apply it to HIV and TB and other um, social issues. So, so while it's been quite difficult, um, we had to adjust the way we worked, we had to take in all sorts of um, considerations and especially in the early phases of the pandemic, it felt like engagements and comms weren't really prioritized. And now we see how important that is because of vaccine hesitancy. Um, as the pandemics progress, there are some positives that have, have sort of emerged out of that. And, and I think um, what we're trying to do is hold on to the positives and, and kind of mitigate the negatives, I guess. Yeah. Absolutely. And I completely resonate with you because I've had multiple instances where people don't really know uh, what I do. And then after the pandemic, I just, you know, yeah. tell them, we are those people who are you know, helping, you know, simplify why and how the virus works and how the vaccines work. And they just quick, they quickly understand what they do. So yeah. that's quite, quite the upside. Uh, so just following up with the discussion, and I won't hold you back for long. Um, how did your experience in, you know, in the focused communications for these two diseases help you uh, strategize for uh, communications in COVID-19. Uh, did that um, have a very big advantage? Um, so there was quite an advantage in the sense that we had already developed some capacity in filmmaking. Um, and I think I was thinking about Sean's point about relatability and representation in communications and engagement. Um, and we had realized, you know, as we had worked that representation in talking about disease is really important. Um, and so we had already developed some trust in the area that we worked in. And so that was really valuable during COVID. Um, and we had also developed capacity to make films. Um, and I guess also sort of pure communication efforts like animations um, that were relatable. And the films in particular really sort of foregrounded this issue of representation and people telling their own stories around infectious disease. So this was really important because it wasn't sort of the, the people who are running our organization. So myself and um, my collaborator, Ed, who's an artist, it wasn't us telling people stories. We had a team of people from the areas that we worked in that were already capacitated to, to look at how the pandemic was impacting people's lives. And I think that's really important. Rather than just a pure communication and informational perspective, allowing people to tell their stories and and showing the impacts of the pandemic really foregrounds the disease, making it human. Um, and so that was really important. And then I think what was really useful for me as a scientist, but I think it was a, in general as an organization, um, we had never really set out, out to become an independent organization and we developed really organically. And so in terms of the development of, an organiz of the organization, there was always a lot of uncertainty around who we were and what we were doing even prior to the pandemic. And I think that experience was really useful during the pandemic because we were used to uncertainty. So changing information, changing needs of beneficiaries. And so that skill, you know, when a lot of people were quite anxious and quite fearful about what was going to happen next, we, we kind of felt like this was normal day-to-day -day running. Um, and I think from a sort of more, I guess, almost ex existential perspective, that was, that was really, really useful um, for the organization. So, yeah. I think I think your initiatives and Evoza's um, a shift during the pandemic is a true testament to understand that you know once you know the fundamentals of how communication and engagement works, you can really uh, work with any uh, topic and any audience that you have uh, at yeah. hand. Right. So thank yeah. you so much, Natasha, for sharing your thoughts. Thank you. And thank you very much. Yeah, you're free to stay thank on for however long you're available for. Thank um, you very much. Yes. With that, we will move on to a more focused um, uh, and more um, Indian approach where we have Madhushri, um, who has been the program manager for, um, you know, Science Gallery Bengaluru. So they recently, not very recently, but rather in this year concluded their um, 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 
science exhibition on online uh, called Contagion. So, um, Madhushri, tell us a little bit about uh, the strategies of engagement in an Indian setting, right? So, and also how maybe uh, if you could uh, reach out to people beyond the, um, you know, internet um, and people who rather had no accessibility to the internet. Yeah, um, thanks, Suchita. And like, I mean, I'd like to thank Sara and Shruti as well for having me as a part of this discussion. And it's great to meet Sean and Tasha again. Obviously, we've been on a couple of sessions together. Um, yeah, Contagion um, was also, I mean, Science Gallery Bengaluru is a new institution. It's part of an international network. But in India and in Asia, it's the really the only institution which is solely focused on public engagement with research and that's really research across the human and natural sciences art design and technology and contagion was our first really fully digital exhibition season which uh, you know ran from the beginning of april to uh, from the end of april and it's closing now in december so it's really been up for almost more than six months and we've had quite an amazing response and I mean, just to maybe like answer your question first, sort of ab about engagement outside of uh, you know the online setting. In I mean, in India, as you know, uh, the digital divide is a very very real and uh, palpable one. We cannot, uh, you know, it's very clear to us that a large portion of our audience uh, of people who need to be able to access this information, this material. Um, do not always have access to digital tools. So, um, yeah, public engagement is um, severely hampered when we have to solely be online. Um, so uh, engagement strategies, of course, in non-COVID times have been, uh, you know, in physical spaces, but also about going out into the community spaces rather than just than in our institutions. So whether it's using spaces like metro stations, whether it is about going really into the field and working with people there, that is, I think, crucial um, for public engagement, taking sort of the research out of the lab, out of the university, uh, into people's comfort zones often has been really an important strategy of course, language is also a big, big indicator there. And uh, as Sean and Tasha spoke, of course, representation, but it's also about age, like uh, Sean mentioned, that sometimes uh, a lot of our focus is on young adults. So these are 18 to 28 year olds, young people who might be going to school, university. In India, a large proportion of whom are actually working. And uh, seeing their peers talk to them, is often a, a very big uh, motivator. It makes a huge amount of difference also in people's interest in wanting to engage and question. So definitely that's something. And I mean, to also sort of find a intermediary, uh, intermediate space between digital engagement and sort of physical engagement. During sort of the peak of COVID, we worked, uh, for instance, we worked with institutions like uh, the Azim Premji Fields Institute, who had like a huge team of volunteers, young adult volunteers, who used to do door-to-door -door campaigns on COVID awareness. So they would go to their own communities to talk to their own, you know, people really about simple basic things, right? Myths about COVID, what, what are the kind of very basic things you can do to like, you know, reduce your fears around it and like how to deal with it. And I mean, this was necessary because these are spaces where social distancing was not possible, right? You have eight members of a family living in a really small house. How can you insist on, you know, things that, you know, say, say so many feet apart, have N95 masks, these things aren't like actually possible. But these young people were out there talking to people, allaying their fears about doing testing uh, so that they were not afraid to actually go get tested or what would happen to them when they go to a COVID care center. But there was a gap still between these volunteers who wanted to say communicate with their communities, but didn't have access to the latest research, right? They didn't have the answers that the community wanted. So what we were able to do, for instance, was because there are so many amazing institutions in Bangalore, like NCBS, like ISC, where like the researchers really know what is going on. We were able to build that bridge between both of them between the community volunteers, between the faculty, and create a whole series of training modules, which allowed, you know, 
people uh, allowed all these questions from the community to directly reach these researchers and the answers to be communicated back through these volunteers to the community because uh, you know writing uh, often calling a helpline writing on a message board it doesn't have the same uh, impact as directly talking to the people who do it or to members of your community who have then spoken to them so it uh, for us it was a huge learning as to how important training upskilling giving people access uh, to be able to ask their own questions without um, fear of evaluation fear of judgment is right and this was of course done entirely over like small mobile phones where there were 10 people over one device right but that's what we could manage in that sort of covid time and we were happy that we could even do that in that situation and we were only able to do that because we had these kind of partners and we were just sort of facilitators to bring together the people who are the on ground sort of young people and these institutions who have the knowledge right so this was really our role and our learning was immense because we understood what were the fears and concerns of the public what were the questions that they wanted to understand that they wanted to know about and this hugely influenced as well the way we thought about our exhibition season and how, what was the kind of material the kind of people the kind of research that we needed to bring into it because uh, there was a lot of there's a lot of information about the disease like misinformation real information but people are talking and people were scared right but where do you provide young people especially a safe space to be able to think about the entire context of this right and that was what the the entire aim of contagion was to provide uh, people a space to question to challenge to ask and to find their own answers um to the things they were thinking about or grappling with really uh, during that entire period and the exhibition opened at the peak of the second wave of covid in india which was a really really difficult time for a lot of people and um, i mean yeah if i get a chance to speak more about the exhibition while i'm here like um i i'd love to like share a bit more about how we wanted to make it not just about diseases but also looking at transmission as a phenomena of both emotions of behavior so people could find um interesting ways to come in and think about it in a way that doesn't have to um make them feel more afraid or give them uh, interesting new doors to start thinking about this right so yeah i mean that's a sort of long winded answer to your question <laughs> of course of course we will we will come and discuss more about contagion and uh, in continuation with uh, whatever nudushi shared i probably uh, want to ask shon to maybe uh, share any uh, not- notable case studies that you might have come across during your communications about the vaccine maybe specifically where you know there could be the vaccine in hesitancy or also people you know uh, get- giving into the misinformation and not wanting to get their second in those for like maybe a specific vaccine right so yeah tell us more yeah i mean i've got two examples so one i want to kind of add to the one i originally kind of um kind of thought up well, this is partly down to uh, medusary's just relevant points there um i think a really nice example is this idea of local champions um and it's something we've used quite a lot in the uk uh, particularly to engage with minority groups who maybe again don't engage with the traditional media routes or in particular in the UK individuals who might have english as their second language for example um and one really good example of this was something done by the national institute of health research in collaboration with um the university of the university of leeds and particularly in bradford which has a a large um ethnic minority population particularly um uh, uh people of a muslim backgrounds um and what the kind of approach was was it was to engage with um 17 18 year old girls who were still in school and educate them on the kind of backgrounds of how the vaccine works and how the science works and get them to go out to the university and speak to family members and particularly older generations who obviously don't have as good english as 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 they would themselves having been second generation um kind of uh individuals um and the feedback we got from this approach was very really positive um and because it's coming from your, your family and 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 kind of friends rather than directly from the scientists who maybe some of those groups don't necessarily um engage with naturally as much um was re- a really really good approach 
Um, the second example is kind of more on this, the idea we were discussing before of the kind of the digital approaches to kind of communicating with different audiences. The University of Oxford's typical digital approaches is to use their own social media kind of uh, accounts. So the university uses Facebook and Instagram and things like that, but it's the university pages. Now, there are people who do regularly uh, follow that information, but it's a very small audience and a very specific audience and maybe not the ones who we actually need to engage um, so early on, one of the approaches we looked at, which was quite an experimental approach and which we'd never used it before, was to engage with social media influencers, particularly teenage social media influencers. Um, and so um, I arranged to do an interview um, through uh, Team Halo, which is a UN backed initiative to use social media to communicate science about the pandemic. Um, and we did um, a 50 minute interview with Amazing Arabella. So Amazing Arabella is a, a UK based influencer who's uh, 17 um, and has done a lot of kind of work with um, kind of charities, but also things like and Disney and modeling and stuff in, as well in the past. Um, now, this approach, the 50 minute interview, which when she put on Instagram, got far more views than we could have achieved ever um, using the traditional university approaches. So we got in the first hour of the video going out, 33,000 views, um, and within the first week, 100,000 views. And that's trumps everything that the university's done and it kind of simple uh, through their own traditional lines. So I think it shows that actually by trying something different, um, we can reach a lot more people and a very specific audience who definitely wouldn't use the traditional uh, media outlets. Yeah, I think um, I would want to discuss a little bit more about the first example you stated on how you can leverage youngsters in the family to inspire the rest of the family. But uh, I would want to take, but before that, I would want to continue the discussion with the second example to Tasha, right? So um, you have a big workforce um, when you know you when you were uh, engaging with the uh, audience while you communicated about HIV and TB. So now when everything went digital, so how did the backend change and how well uh, could your team adopt uh, these changes and how can you give us a little more insights? Yeah, so that's a really good question. Um, so South Africa is quite interesting in the sense that not a lot of people access the internet using personal computers or laptops. So most of the internet is ac accessed via mobile devices and even then data costs are really, really expensive. Um, so early on in the pandemic, you know, we were making decisions sort of three to six months at a time, watching how things changed. And we decided we wouldn't move to a digital platform besides for our own internal team. Um, we, thought, we thought we'd wait it out and see. Most of our engagement was very workshop in-person based. And we thought, okay, we'll put everything on pause and see what happens um, as we go forward. But our training initiatives of our teams moved into WhatsApp and into Zoom meetings and stuff. And that was very successful. Um, subsequently, we started administering some surveys to understand where our target audience was accessing information and where our target audience was trusting information from. And it's quite different to, um, I, I'd say, the UK and maybe other global north countries where social media is heavily accessed, but actually traditional media is also a really important um, place to get health information for people. And so, again, we made a conscious decision not to invest the resources in moving all of our activities online. And um, instead we tried to develop partnerships with um, traditional media groups and groups that had a big social media presence. So we started disseminating some of our media with a health journalism um, organization that's, that's very well known and very well trusted in South Africa called Becky Sisa. And then we started to go really sort of micro where like very localized newspapers. So we work a lot in Kailicha, which is a township in Cape Town. And there's a newspaper that is disseminated in the, basically just in Kailicha. And we started converting our animations into printed banners um, so that people could access information from those newspapers. Um, we, we've, we've tried a bit to move into radio, which our survey says is a very, very important um, form of communication for people. And that's been a bit more challenging, but it's something we're working on. Um, and now we're hoping that um, even though the pandemic is ongoing, you know, the sentiment has changed and, and people are starting to say, you know, we need to live with the pandemic instead of having a lockdown or a shutdown every time we have a surge. Um, we, we feel confident that with what we've learned in terms of safety, we can start hosting in-person in -person workshops again. So, so it, was very, it was a very sort of back and forth dis discussion, but we eventually made a conscious decision not to go digital um, and to hold out and try to find ways of, 
are firstly finding out from people where they get and trust health information from and then finding ways to target um, those platforms. Community TV is also a big one um, and, and we developed a partnership there too. Um, yeah, so I hope that answers. Absolutely, that helps a lot because um, I understand that, you know, while we move digital, there are a lot of advantages, but it, we also have to be conscious about uh, the privileges anyone has to the access of the, to the internet and uh, cater to even more for people who don't have these privileges. So uh, thank you for sharing your thoughts, Sasha. Um, I, I want to... Um, now discuss a little detail, a little more in detail about Contagion with Madushi because uh, now I'm, I know that, you know, when Contagion was launched, it was in the middle of, you know, the second wave pandemic in India and everything like, you know, just shut down and we couldn't even just go out, right? So it was practically uh, a digital effort that you, you, although you wanted to uh, try and make it a hybrid one. So tell us more um, about um, uh, contagion and uh, also uh, how deliberate was this uh, you know topic so did you did you make um, a conscious decision to pick this up or was it um, you know uh, something that you had already thought about and was just like a culmination <laughs> for the panel um, yeah it it's it's sort of a mix of both really so in early january uh, to answer your second question first in early january we we had two themes in mind for the next sort of two exhibitions one which was around um zo zoonosis zoonotic disease a spillover we were thinking of something around that and uh, we were also looking at of course around mental health and the mind so these were two things that were sort of on our radar in terms of concerns uh, that people were, of course, thinking about. Um, and as the sort of the initial um, bit of the pandemic started, we realized that it would uh, maybe this is the one that we do first. And uh, our next exhibition is Psyche, which looks at the, the second topic that I talked about, which is opening next year. But uh, yeah, so it was. Uh, and when we started working on it, things were still very they were just kind of like ramping up. No one really knew how it would go. So we were looking at it very, very broadly. It was it it was never it was never conceptualized with COVID in mind. Uh, very honestly speaking, it was really looking at like I said, the transmissions of diseases, emotions, and behaviors, and. Uh, especially because in December, which was just before the exhibition opened, the situation in India was like it had sort of really calmed down and people were, it, people were very positive about how things were going to change. So, um, however, within a few months, things really turned around. And I think what was important for us, Bye, Tasha, uh, was... Thank you so much, Tasha. Sorry to interrupt, Navishri. Thank you so much, Tasha. Yeah. Sorry, sorry to interrupt. And thank you and apologies again. Bye, everyone. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Thanks for joining. Okay. Yeah, so I guess what was really important for us was that we use the programming of the exhibition to be really responsive to things that were happening in the now. Right. So even though the exhibits themselves were like really thought out, they were a culmination of probably several years of research of artists and scientists, the programming allowed us to be very responsive. So everything from, we had an amazing talk by uh, Chitra Patabiraman, who for instance was mapping mutant variants of COVID in Bangalore, right? At the point at which people were starting to talk about different variants. And then of course we had Galvindeep Kang talk about vaccines, which I mean, that session was just quite amazing. There were more than 200 questions from the audience in that session. And the, and the beauty of a place like ours is that we had a, contrasting talk by a vaccine activist, Achal Prabhala, who also looked at why is there this uh, dissonance in trust between vaccines, say, created in the UK versus vaccines created in China or Russia. And what does that mean? What's the politics of vaccine distribution, right? Which was an equally important uh, conversation at that point of time as to who gets vaccines, how much and for how soon, right? So uh, we were really able to use our programming to uh, build this sort of discourse around the 
concerns, uh, whether it was modeling, whether it was like everyone was looking at graphs, right? So we had got the men and talk about how these models are important. What does it really mean, right? SIR, like everyone knew it, but what was it all about? So we could use this to uh, address things that were coming up in you know sort of real time but we equally had like uh, these sort of left of center talks like we had um, a literary historian speak about contagion on the dance floor we had contagion in social networks we had uh, the who infodemic team talk about misinformation so we were really looking at contagion from very very different angles and i think that was uh, something that we, I think, unlike where the sort of research institutions and the scientists were focused on making sure that like this really real time, authentic information of, for public health, here we were trying to get people to find the confidence to write, ask the right questions, make the right decisions, and think, uh, you know, think about the challenges around us, right? And uh, that that was very much the intent with Contagion. And it had, of course, everything from performance. So um, this weekend, I'll, I'll just share the link in the chat when you know you continue talking. We have Contagion cabarets actually from Oxford, and uh, Professor Shally, uh, Sally Shuttleworth and her team look at sort of the history of pandemics and how how is that influenced with performance, and then of course the the correlations it has with what we're going through today, right? So. I mean, we had a lot of historians talk in the exhibition because it's amazing everything from the Spanish flu to the Bombay plague, right? And uh, you see a repeat, right, of things and uh, what we can learn from that or what we may not have learned from that. So uh, really, if you can use art and performance and these kinds of things to also bring people into the doors to make them receptive and interested in this, um, yeah, I think that that was what contagion was all about yeah okay yeah so i think um i probably want to pose this question to both of you right so maybe uh, could you uh, touch upon like a few elements that um you can think of to make your efforts and initiatives more personal um or more humane maybe uh, talk a little bit about that um, maybe sean you can go first yeah, I very much agree on the, the kind of idea that we need to integrate more about like social sciences and arts into kind of the work we're doing in, in sciences. And I think this is an approach that was taken increasingly in my experience in, um, for example, science festivals and stuff before uh, the pandemic. Um, there's been some, I've been some fantastic um, stuff, things like uh, acapella science um, or dance associated with science. I mean, there's like dance, PA, dance my PhD and things like that. And I think it does make it more accessible. Um, and the other advantage of this is very much, for example, with breaking down language barriers. And that's one of the obviously the other kind of areas which are, are, are really, really important. Um, I think on terms of the kind of uh, the adding the kind of personal touch to it, um, I think from my personal experience, um, if you're trying to engage with a medium um, that you personally uh, enjoy and and have a lot of experience of I think it really helps communicate that message um, I've done I, I now work a lot more through the kind of university's kind of central public engagement and encouraging people to apply for kind of public engagement grants um, and I use the example as, as I mentioned at the start that I uh, pre-pandemic was doing a lot of projects on using board games as a way of communicating science I love board games um, I'm, I'm an avid collector, I love playing them, and I love playing them with the, the public, but I also particularly love science-themed uh, ones, and thinking about the mechanisms behind the board games, because actually there's some really cool mechanisms um, that are used in these games that can actually directly apply to the science that you're trying to explain. And it's interesting, I've been asked to kind of help consult a lot of other scientists with these projects, because they're like, oh, we, th we can see the importance of using board games as a tool, but we don't have any experience of using them ourselves. Um, and it's amazing how just kind of going, look, most people go, oh, a board game, let's think of Monopoly. And for me, Monopoly is a terrible, terrible example because it's very simple. It doesn't have any interesting mechanisms. It's not very well balanced. Um, and so, yeah, that's that's kind of a, an approach. But equally, this can be applied to anything. If you are, if you dance in your spare time, use think about using dance to communicate your science. If you're an avid um, musician, 
you, you obviously use your music and, and integrate those things. So, and it's about showing that you're passionate. A lot of scientists are passionate about the science, but equally they have equal other passions that again, humanize them um, and, and kind of bring it, bring everyone onto an equal kind of level. Uh, thank you, Sean. Uh, Madhushi, do you want to touch on that a little bit? Um, so, I mean, I mean, Science Gallery, Bengaluru exhibitions are all about the personal touch, really. So, I mean, our exhibitions typically, even in the physical space, you we don't encourage visitors to see it alone. You you see it with mediators. So, mediators are these young young people who are in their uh, who are in the age group, eighteen to twenty eight. And they are from every background. So they might be studying economics, design, history, uh, sociology. And they uh, are trained with the artists, with the scientists whose work is shown in the exhibition. And they actually uh, become conversationalists in the exhibition. So for Contagion, people could sign up for these sessions where you could come uh, online with the mediator who would personally like uh, have a conversation with you for an hour and take you through the exhibition so you got to meet new people when in a time when you were completely socially distanced and isolated young people from all parts of India who had these amazing insights into the exhibits and who got to know you and got to tailor this journey for you based on your interests. So you, everyone got a really personalized way of seeing the exhibition where they could share their experiences or uh, the mediators shared their own experiences. And together they came, they had a conversation, right? So it wasn't just about sort of seeing the exhibit, oh, okay, I learned something, and this is something new. But it was really about talking, discussing, even arguing sometimes, right? And that deepens the engagement so much more. And uh, it also gives this very human touch in a time when people were, you know, separated. And uh, we did these sessions, not just in English, but in Telugu, in Tamil, in Hindi. So it also makes it far more... Um, you know, accessible, people feel comfortable, right? You can talk, you can have your coffee there, you can have your, this thing and you can just not chat, right? So, and that's really important to feel comfortable while engaging. Absolutely. And I think at this point, I really want to uh, say that um, the concept of having mediators at exhibitions is a wonderful idea. And, and I think that is, uh, that was uh, like, you know, uh, you know, light bulb moment when I, you know, found out about this, right? So thank you so much, Madhushi. So with this, I prob I'll probably take one last point of discussion with both of you and leave the uh, uh, floor for discussion. So I think in the meantime, the audience can uh, drop in their comments and questions and if anyone would like to raise their hands can come on stage um, so I think uh, to wrap up this conversation I think it's very important for all of us to uh, discuss and understand how uh, we evaluate um, all our efforts and also how we keep the momentum going after uh, the event, after the pandemic, or you know, uh, whatever has happened, the initiatives that we've taken so far, right? So uh, maybe um, would you like to share a few ideas or plans that you have uh, to evaluate and also take your efforts forward? Um, Malushri, you can go first. All right. So, I mean, evaluation is very important. Uh, I mean, there are two kinds, primarily things that we do internally for ourselves, but also sort of an uh, independent uh, outside evaluation as well. Um, a lot of it, of course, uh, I saw the sort of end of Sarah's uh, talk. A lot of it is, of course, qualitative and uh, which we gain through feedback about, uh, you know, the exhibition, about every program that we're able to put through. Also, we do much more deeper sort of long-term evaluation with our mediators because they've you know, they've engaged in a very different way. They would have spoken to thousands of people over the days of the exhibition. So sort of getting their insights is gives you a very different sense of understanding the impact of this kind of program. So these are sort of the kinds of, we do an internal evaluation. We look at our participants, qualitative, quantitative feedback, and, uh, you know, hopefully as we expand or grow as an institution, we'll be also be able to do a sort of external evaluation to understand you know learning impact and so on what are the long-term things because uh, it's hard to often see immediate changes you are looking for a long-term change in how people are thinking about science 
and um sorry what was the second question how do you keep the momentum going yeah so um i think for us especially given that we change our work our team every season it's uh, about contributing to the knowledge commons everything really from the exhibition becomes a public resource so all the 20 25 plus lectures the um the resources all the research the team does to put together so we have more than 500 plus research links on the various topics which are there at the exhibition there's a handbook of activities and experiments that's there and all this remains in the creative commons it's out there on our exhibition archive for people to use and what we are working on is putting this together in the form of modules or in form of learning material that uh, teachers educators could take to their classroom to um, their community to another museum to another science center and mobilize all this to do it again right because all the effort that sort of goes in we want this to remain as a sort of legacy right as a public good that can be uh, mobilized again and again for those who would like to use it so that is for us really the way of even though we might now focus on another topic to make sure that these resources are there for the public and uh, i think we are working on figuring out how to maximize the utilization right so we'd love to be able to work with people like you to understand how can we better integrate with the communities who could use this i get other science communicators science engagement professionals to take these resources and really um, use them in their spaces awesome awesome thank you so much madushi uh, yes yeah, shawn you can go on now Yeah so I think the, the two key words here obviously are evaluation and legacy and I think um I mean evaluation I've worked a lot with the kind of the central university team who have really tried over the last couple of years to promote different ways of obviously evaluating resources and obviously we've got two very much different approaches when you've got digital evaluation versus obviously in person and they do tell you different things I think sometimes just recording stats from digital things can be misleading um because you don't always know the quality if you just look at say views or hits on a kind of digital piece that doesn't tell you the whole story um until you look at how long someone engaged on and actually they actually understand it that can be not the best measure necessarily rather than when you're doing something in person in small numbers um and engaging directly um you always get a feel um for whether the person you're talking to has understood what you're doing and i think it's the same with conferences when you're doing giving these type of uh, talks um digitally and online um it's very hard to see the audience you don't always um visualize um whether people are nodding and agreeing with you or disagreeing with you um or sleep uh so it's it's kind of um can be quite difficult in that sense Um I think it's easier to develop novel approaches when it's in person. Um again going back to kind of a, a previous examples from my personal experience um producing evaluation materials for young audiences. So the, with my board games thing we worked on a kind of a novel project for engaging um which we made feedback dice. So we basically rather than asking kids to fill out a form, we got them to build a little dice and write their feedback within the dice. And half the time they wanted to build the dice and do the evaluation activity before they played any of the games. So there's still learning curves and, and obviously novel kind of ways of doing that. But um it, I think it yeah it's something that going forward we need to find a good balance of the two. And definitely like for example on a personal scale I have no very little experience on that digital feedback but I feel I can contribute more to that kind of um kind of in person feedback. Um in terms of legacy I think again it's something that is very important uh, going forward to plan for in advance of any kind of public engagement project and I think um when it comes to, again to planning for big projects um like for example contagion um you can plan to have a, an online resource that that you perhaps has legacy and that's one of the beauties um of online digital stuff versus in in kind of in person stuff which sometimes can be hard to have legacy there's a lot of change over in staff in 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 both science and also in public engagement and I definitely in the university here um in oxford it's something that i've seen in, improving over the last couple of years in terms of building the kind of community between public engagement staff within the university breeding a kind of um legacy of 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 collaboration across the sciences 
um, and obviously across different um, institutions. So going for the social science, again, back to this idea of mixing the sciences and the arts and history, historians, and getting those collaborations. And I think to really build on the legacy of public engagement, we need to maintain those staff doing it. Unfortunately, within the universities, there aren't always formal roles for public engagement. My role has been very much a kind of bred out of necessity um, because of the pandemic. Um, we're hoping obviously to, to make this kind of permanent thing. And I'm very keen to kind of move across as a permanent into, permanently into public engagement rather than um, kind of lab science. Um, but whether that still requires money and funding. And again, this is another point that having the money there and, and people's recognition uh, that public engagement is as important as the science itself. And I think definitely in our institution, the pandemic has shown that that is very much the case. Wonderful. Um, I, th I think um, at every stage of engagement and communication, we always have those learning curves and there's not that one perfect way to uh, engage with a particular audience, right? So with that, we'll take up some questions from the audience. Um, I think uh, we have our first question from Anupam for Madhushri. Uh, so um, he says, uh, as, you're, uh, as you change both in the sciences and design, um, could you share some uh, learnings that you got from your training in design, which you find it useful in science communication or exhibit design? Yeah, I mean, absolutely. I think like uh, studying design was a very, <laughs> uh, it was very different from uh, being trained as a scientist in the lab. So, um, but yeah, there, there are some very basic and sort of key things that you learn to focus on, which is like, firstly, stepping away from this idea of that, your your role is sort of to teach someone something and uh, that it's all about your audience right audience or the visitor or the user or whatever whatever word you might want to put there comes first right and it's all about understanding them and what they need and then uh, so that i mean in terms of thinking just conceptually thinking that becomes sort of central when especially in terms of design because you you're always sort of trained to look at what is the what is the problem statement and what is the need and then to work towards delivering or uh, proposing something that could resolve that need and i guess uh, typically we we had content and then you're like you have to kind of pitch you know make sure this content is communicated but then maybe the person on the under, other end needs something else Right, and to find that sort of bridge that gap, to find what is the what it is that people relate to, and what it is they want to understand, what is that hook that they need to be able to relate it to their everyday. Uh, I guess that was for me the biggest change in my thinking. And of course, there's also a lot of technical skills that you know you pick up because as Sean said a lot of it is and Tasha mentioned as well it's a lot of it is visual it's about um, communicating or like engaging in a way that's uh, often not it is interesting right it's interesting it's relatable so uh, to be able to use different kinds of mediums whether it's visual sound or even experiential touch uh, to be able to kind of get out of maybe the, the, the typical what we assume uh, is uh, the best way or the simplest way. Sometimes you need a way that challenges your visitor that requires them to do something, right? So these, these kind of things can make uh, informal learning a lot more fun. And uh, also, also like you may not always be thinking about very young people, right? You might be thinking about... Uh, like we work especially with uh, young adults, right? Whose concerns are different, whose uh, the way they look at the world is different, right? So again, just being able to bracket your, you know, understanding your specific target audiences, who they are, and then developing that uh, way of thinking for them, right? Like looking at contagion for like a very young person, we might look at contagious laughter, while we look at uh, teenagers, we might look at, computer viruses, right? It's a different way of approaching the same issue. So uh, I guess it kind of helped me open my way of thinking like a sort of less siloed or less um, focused way of thinking, looking at it a little laterally, looking at those things, but also a lot of technical skills of using different mediums 
and uh, giving me, I guess, some of the idea of things like affordances. How do you build things that people may not need instructions on how to use, right? Like you see it and you know that this is what I do with it. So a lot of design uh, thinking or like design tools are very useful in uh, making good science, either science communication or science engagement materials. So I think there's much to be found at the intersection of these two, uh, both because not just because science could do with design, but also because design uh, can learn a lot from science, right? The rigor of science, uh, the method of doing something and knowing like what the way of knowing or doing in science is really useful for design because design can also give sometimes the wrong idea, right? Like, uh, especially if you look at like graphs or data visualization, sometimes it can give, it might convey a message that isn't real. So also for those who are doing design to understand like the research method, the rigor of it, why things are a certain way, it also leads to good communication of information. So it's really a two-way street, uh, absolutely. And like, I feel both disciplines can really inform each other. And yeah, I was lucky to be able to kind of um, see both sides of it. And I feel it hugely influences my work at the gallery. This, this discourse about how you can draw parallels with uh, science and design, something that people really think that are two very different things, I think uh, is a true testament to tell people that uh, science communication need not and should not be siloed. And you can always adopt um, learnings, concepts and principles from different, um, you know, um, fields of study, right? So now we have Sarah Iqbal who's raised her hand. Um, I'll let, let her on stage and ask a question. Thank you so much, Sajita. And uh, I'm, I'm really uh, thankful to both Sean and Madhushri for sharing such wonderful, um, you know, the, their experiences from the COVID uh, times and how they really addressed uh, communication and engagement during such difficult times. I'm really, really inspired by all that you did. Um, I'm just wondering what has been your uh, key unlearnings? Like what have you unlearned as a science communicator or, or a practitioner of science or as, as someone who's, who's kind of relaying information to the public or engaging with the public uh, in, during peacetime? What has been your key unlearning during the pandemic? Okay. Sean, would you want to go first? <laughs> Yeah, so it's also a very good question. I, mean, I think probably the most important, as some, as as a scientist in training, uh, or, and obviously an experienced scientist, um, knowing when to use the kind of detailed explanation versus a, a very simple lay explanation. Um, for example, I, I, a lot of my work as, as the kind of scientist on our comms team is, is writing, for example, FAQs and doing lay summaries of our complicated papers and things. Um, and very much at the start, uh, when I was doing this role, even my lay versions were still arguably too complicated or too long for general public release. And I think gradually I learned that to kind of have those kind of two different levels and, and split the kind of information. Um, I, throughout my kind of public engagement kind of uh, career and stuff, I've loved, loved using analogies to explain science. And this is something that I have kind of built on. And especially when you're writing pieces for the public consumption, um, this, this is a kind of an early approach. So I've used that uh, through animation and through um, also kind of written pieces. Um, obviously, when you're communicating with the media, you need to have it slightly more formal, but I, I always find these for kind of public consumption are a really good way of communicating um, the kind of science behind. But yeah, that's definitely been my own learning to kind of really simplify. And it's for me, it's quite difficult because at the same time, um, I'm still finishing up a lot of the kind of academic papers and things that I was doing before the science. So I literally have two completely different approaches where I'm writing a paper and I'm getting told to write it more formally while I'm writing the kind of con stuff and getting told to make it less formal. So um, that interface can be difficult sometimes. Okay. <laughs> I really hope you find that equilibrium for yourself. <laughs> yeah. Yes, Madhushri, do you want to share your thoughts? Uh, I, I, yeah, I mean, there were too many things I learned, but I'm guessing, I mean, more specifically in terms of, Unlearning, uh, I think uh, we, I think I'm, what I particularly may have unlearned is there's this sort of, however hard you try, you come in as an individual with a lot of assumptions 
about many things about uh, you know how you think people are thinking or what you think people want uh, especially in a time like this right because it's of course hugely embedded in our own privilege that you know we are in a space that say you were able to work remotely you were able to do certain things you know life was able to continue in a certain way and i guess that was something i like hugely learned to unlearn like sort of stop making those or try to stop making those assumptions i can't say that you know we've been completely successful but uh, i think given the kind of diversity of reach that we managed to have with this exhibition mostly because of the nature of the topic um, i think it was very eye opening for me to be able to see that sometimes a very different approach is needed and uh, you know you be you are not often in the position to be able to do it like you also sort of face um you know you hit the sort of wall that you don't know how to like fix a certain thing right like how much ever you may want to and it's it is a bit frustrating or like uh, but then you also realize that you can't do everything it's a community of people and that's where having partners working with other institutions working with other people is really really important because the sort of the final impact that we have it's not something that we can really do alone right we are we are important like we have a role to play but also understanding our role and then being able to work with others to have that larger impact is really key so i think getting rid of some of those assumptions of what we are able to do and being open to these kind of collaborations and you know being flexible and learning to work in a new situation that's something really which i think i'm still learning but yeah that that i was saying like i feel that was a big sort of uh, this particular sort of time uh, made it more apparent and something that we as me personally but also as an institution that we you know will take forward from here okay thank you so much Yeah, thank you Sarah for the question. Yeah, I think I totally resonate with you considering how as scientists and researchers we're trained to assume before we, you know, test any hypotheses and now it's a complete flip side. So, um I hope uh, we all are taking all of our learnings and unlearnings from this pandemic uh, taking it forward and also um consciously evaluating how our uh, communication and engagement efforts are evolving from now on with that i'll wrap up this uh, panel discussion i am immensely grateful and thankful for shan madhushree and tasha for joining us in this conversation thank you so much thank you thank you, you. thanks achita thank you sara thank you so much everyone uh, i hope the audience has had fun throughout and has many takeaways to ponder over and implement in their everyday practice thank you hey